Hello everybody. Welcome to CS350. This is University of Waterloo's Operating Systems course. It's my pleasure to be teaching the course this term. My name is Ali Mashtizadeh, and this is one of my favorite courses because this is my core area of research. So let's get through a few administrative things today. We'll then talk a little bit about why we should be learning operating systems and then cover a little bit about what an operating system is and what that what it really means. So here we have a few administrative things. First is the class website. All the assignments, the handouts, and the projects will be available here. My website, where I have, will be placing my lecture notes and links to other resources, including some of the papers and other uh, videos that I think you should go see if you want to learn more. And finally, the textbooks for the course that we'll be using and the readings will be listed on the class website. The next thing is that all of the questions and answers will be done through either office hours or you can do it through Piazza so that everyone can benefit from each other's questions. We have our quizzes and finals that will be delivered through Waterloo Learn and we're going to have several course projects that are going to be due throughout the term. So let's talk for a second about why we want to learn systems, right? And this is sort of stepping back even a little bit further than talking about operating systems. We're talking about systems and systems is a really broad area. And this operating systems course is meant to give you an opportunity to see all of these areas, to see a little bit about all the techniques and all of the sorts of interesting ideas that are applied throughout all the areas of systems. No matter what you're working on, there's going to be some kind of systems aspect to it. So obviously, if you're working on operating systems, this course would be very relevant. But even if you're working on things like distributed systems or networking, Internet of Things, these are all systems areas from computer architecture and embedded systems. And things like databases are all parts of systems. And finally, there's also a lot of categories where systems is joined with another area. So systems and machine learning, thinking about how do you make machine learning problems scale? How do you make them efficient to run across large clusters of machines so you can solve problems that wouldn't otherwise be possible? These are still systems problems. The more specific goal of the course is to teach you and help you understand operating systems. We wanna introduce you to what to operating systems are, how they work, and if you think about it, every computer phone and watch you'll ever use uses an operating systems. Most embedded systems use operating systems. So helping you understand the operating system is going to make you a more effective programmer. It's going to help you understand how the OS affects the performance of your software and how doing different changes to your software might help you improve your software in terms of performance, reliability, or correctness. Next, we'll introduce you to general systems concepts. Thinking about concurrency, memory management, I.O., and protection are going to be some of the key ideas that we'll focus on in this course. And I also want to sort of bring in some ideas and discuss performance and how you can think about building better applications. And the last thing is that in this version of the lecture, we'll try to add a little bit more of a real world experience to it by bringing in some of my own personal experience after working for about five years at VMware working on a hypervisor and the kernel and the user space for that system. And also some of my research experience and general research out there that might apply to problems that you're working on. So for the rest of the lecture, we're going to look at what an operating system is and the basic abstractions that it provides. So an operating system is basically a layer between your applications and your hardware. The main goal here is to try to make the hardware more useful to you as a programmer. So if we look at this example here, Emacs, GCC, and even your video games will be running on top of an operating system so that they don't have to think about all the details of the hardware. Typically, the operating system is going to provide a set of drivers that are going to abstract away a lot of the details of the hardware, the different versions, the different brands of hardware that might be running under you, and it's going to provide you usually a more useful abstraction, some kind of higher level interfaces that make the hardware more useful to you. 
Often, operating systems will also provide you some form of protection. This might protect your game from damaging your applications and your other personal data, or protect you from other users that might accidentally clobber some of your data. So why are we studying operating systems? Most operating systems are already pretty established. It's a maturing field, and most of you will never work on an OS or have the chance to build a new OS. The reason is that a lot of problems, as you can see, because we're running underneath the operating system and the operating system is the main interface between us and hardware, are operating system issues. High performance servers or high performance anything practically is an operating system issue. Resource management, consumption, bat thinking about battery life, memory, CPU, radio spectrum, these are all essentially operating systems issues. Security, is also an operating system issue. It's hard to have security without a solid foundation underneath us. And also, there's an opportunity with all these new smart devices and IoT devices to build new operating systems. Finally, you can think about a web browser, a database, and a game engine. The interesting thing about all three of these applications is that they resemble an operating system. They all face operating systems issues they all apply the same techniques that are used in operating systems to solve those problems. So learning from the operating system is a good opportunity to think about these sort of specialized applications that have complex issues to solve. Throughout the course, we're gonna cover a set of topics. We'll start with talking about threads and processes, and then we'll talk about concurrency and synchronization. How do you make your application scale to many cores and use all the hardware efficiently. And then we'll talk, discuss other issues of the operating system, including scheduling, virtual memory, and then look at IO devices and disks and file systems. And finally, we'll get to touch on security and protection and look at maybe some more modern issues like virtual machines and containers toward the end of term. Throughout this course, I'm gonna use Unix as the main example, mostly because this is the most prevalent operating system. Occasionally, we may use Windows but also we'll also be able to use that as the basis to help you with OS 161. OS 161 resembles Unix systems. It's really modeled after them, just meant to be a simple or scaled down version that we can use for course projects. So let's look at the most primitive operating system that we could have. The most primitive operating system is just a library of services. We might not provide any protection we might provide very simple services, but it's just a standard in library that's designed to support the hardware and make it a little more useful for an application developer. This is the kind of operating system you would find in an embedded device or an IoT device. And it's gonna make a lot of simplifying assumptions. It's gonna assume that it's writing, running just one single program and that there are no bad users that are gonna do something malicious or bad programs that might do something malicious. The only problem with this system, while this works really well for embedded systems, is that it's not really offering us a way to utilize the hardware effectively. If we think about it, if we wanna support multiple users or multiple applications, we need some way to use multiple applications and support multiple users so that we can share the device. The next type of operating system is an operating system that implements some form of multitasking. So the idea here is that we wanna be able to run more than one program at once. So here in this diagram, you can see that GCC and Emacs are both running on our operating system. When one of these programs is blocked, for example, Emacs is waiting for user input, GCC could run in the background doing compilation. What's the problem with this basic approach? The main problem being that well, I haven't really described what happens when a program is ill-behaved. So imagine that Emacs goes into an infinite loop and never wants to give up your CPU. Or think that GCC might have a bug and it starts scribbling all over memory and it could damage your data that's in Emacs. Operating systems provide two mechanisms to deal with these issues. The first is preemption, where we can take away resources from an application and hand it to another. So if Emacs is sitting there and waiting 
and looping and not actually handing the CPU back to the OS will take it away and hand it to the GCC so both programs get a chance to run. The second mechanism is memory protection, where we'll protect the memory of one process from the other. This will ensure that GCC, if it misbehaves, it can't damage your data in EMAC. The next type of operating system that we can talk about is a multi-user OS, extending this idea that we've had already to so support multiple users. Many operating systems are going to use these standard protection mechanisms to be able to serve a bunch of distrustful users or distrustful applications at the same time. And the basic idea is that when we share hardware among a set of users, we're not going to be as slow as one over the number of users because most of the user's usage is bursty. If you look at your computer or you look even at, at servers in the data center, for the most part, they're underutilized. Most of the time, you're not really doing anything with your computer. It's sitting there waiting for you to click and do something, to give it input, to tell it to run a particular task. It runs that task, it completes, and then it's gonna again be idle and not doing things. So during that time, we could give it to another user and allow multiple users to share it. And we're gonna win because, as I said, most of us are not really using our computer all the time, so if we can share that computer, we can make more effective use of those resources. Well, how can this go wrong? And this can go wrong in three main ways. The first, that users could be abusing the resource. They might be running their Bitcoin miner when another user is trying to get work done. So we need to be able to enforce policies on the computer to ensure that users can't take resources away from each other and each user gets a reasonable share. The second is that they might use too much of a resource that's needed. Imagine that they all wanna use a lot of memory. You each wanna do a computation that needs lots of resources. Well, memory is a limited resource and we're eventually gonna to have to do something to deal with that. And the way that we often do it, deal with it is to virtualize that resource, to pretend we have more of something than we do, and then dole out a reasonable fraction to each application. And the third thing that we might have to think about is, could we get into a pathological case where we see a super linear slowdown because the demand is just so high? So to sort of summarize here from these, these sort of views of the operating system that we've been looking at, there's a set of mechanisms for protection that protect bad programs and people from hurting other users on the system or other applications on the system. The first is preemption, where we take away resources if we think that they're needed elsewhere in the system. The second is some form of interposition or mediation the operating system sits between the application and the hardware, allowing us to take away any resource or to check and verify every access to a resource to see whether we should allow that access or not, to ensure nothing is being abused, an unfair share isn't being given out, and access to other users' data isn't being handed to a malicious application or user. And the third is some form of separation of privilege that we're gonna depend on the hardware in the processor to separate the operating system from the application. You can think back to the hardware course that you took last term or last year. The privileges, there's two privileged modes on the processor. One is the unprivileged mode or user mode where the application is running. And there's the operating system supervisor or kernel mode as it's sometimes called where we have access to all privileged resources. We have access to all kinds of special instructions that the operating system, that the hardware gives us. And we have access to all of the hardware devices, device IO, so forth. All the protection can be done in privilege mode. Any protection that's done after the hardware protection that's being offered to the OS will be done through this privilege mode. So let's look quickly at a typical OS structure we have up here. Most operating systems will resemble this. There are a lot of different architectures out there, but at a high level, we essentially have two categories. We have a user mode where our processes are running. These are untrusted 
by the OS. Each one gets its access to resources. It believes it's running by itself. And two is the kernel mode where the kernel has all of its services that it's providing to the application, the file system, the communications, networking, and all of the resource management that it does to create and support processes. All the process creation itself is inside of the operating system. It's just software management in the operating system. And finally, all the device drivers that support all of these kernel services to connect to the outside world, to connect to storage to place your data, or a console or a graphics card to interact with a user, and networking to communicate with other computers out there. So the way that the application and the operating system communicate, the way that the application can access all of these services are through special function calls. And we call these function calls system calls. So many of you have already programmed in C and you might use calls like open, read, and write. All of these calls are examples of system calls. While the libc library might provide this call what it's doing is it's going to call the kernel and tell the kernel to do a particular task, to open a file. And what this is, is this is just a controlled interface to allow the application and the kernel to communicate. It'll allow the application to make a request. The hardware will facilitate giving the kernel control and allowing the kernel to run the particular function it wants. <clears throat> And then the kernel will take over and it looks much like application code. It'll do all the tasks that it's written requested. And then finally, it'll return back whatever the result is to the user application. And we'll switch back to the user application and allow it to continue executing. Typically in most OSs, there's only a few hundred system calls that are implemented in the kernel and everything is built on top of that. So the main goal of these system calls is just to take the things that are not able to be completed in, in an unprivileged mode. So opening a file, accessing hardware resources, these things cannot be done by the application directly. So we make a call, a system call into the kernel to allow it to do it. And we've created this well-defined interface of a bunch of function calls that are supported by the system call interface. We have a bunch of higher level functions such as printf, scanf, gets, all of these are user level code that are built on top of simpler calls like read and write. So in most Unix operating systems and in OS161, we'll see that open, close, read and write are examples of system calls. So to put this together, we can see this example that when you write printf in your program and you see some printout in the console, What's actually happening is code is running in multiple places. Your program calls printf, the standard C library, then takes that and turns into a single string. And then it's gonna call the write system call to actually output that to the actual screen. And most of the rest of the magic is happening inside of the operating system. So today we got to talk a little bit about the operating system and how it relates to your applications. We're gonna pick this up next time and continue to dive into the detail of how processes are constructed and how they relate to the kernel and look at all of these ideas that we've seen in more detail slowly over the next few weeks.